position of perhaps unlikely bedfellows. Um, I want to talk about Karl Korsch, who was a, a German revolutionary, um, mostly active in the 20s, um, and compare some of his ideas with those of the contemporary French philosopher uh, Alain Badiou, who you, you may have heard of. Um, I, I want to start with just a, a brief um, introduction to who Karl Korsch was, because he is one of these figures who, again, a bit like Long Key, kind of pops in and out of, 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 uh, of history in terms of whether people remember him or not. Uh, uh, I came across him because Verso recently republished this book he wrote in 1923 called, called Marxism and Philosophy, which is his kind of major work, um, which uh, caused, a, caused a, a fuss at the time and then later got forgotten, got rediscovered in the sort of post-68 era, forgotten again, and um, seems to be popping up again now, so, so that's why I kind of, uh, kind of got interested in him. Um, so, so, so who was he, and uh, why should we care about him? Um, the basic bi biographical facts are these. He was, he was born in 1886 uh, near Hamburg from a sort of lower middle class family. Um, his, his dad was, uh, worked as a secretary and then a bank manager and was a big fan of, of Leibniz. He, he spent all his time, spare time writing this vast unpublished work on Leibniz and his theory of monads. So I, I, I was very pleased to hear this when I, when I heard about that. It's a very cool thing to do. Um, he, um, Korsch became kind of, um, sort of fell into sort of liberal, left liberal circles as a student, circa 1908. Uh, moved to England in 1912, started, uh, worked in England for a couple of years, where he joined the Fabian Society, the first, the first um, actual political organisation he joined. He considered himself a socialist, but the first uh, organisation he joined was a Fabian support of all people. Um, returned to Germany in 1914, where he was conscri conscripted, um, and had a very bizarre military career. He was decorated, um, won two, two iron crosses, but he refused to carry any weapons. He was a pacifist, and so he would go into, uh, without any kind of rifle or, or gun or sword or anything, and somehow he managed to get away with this <laughs> during the war, arguing that basically he was just as likely to get killed if he was carrying a weapon as not. And he was there to basically to protect the other troops and make sure as many of them came back as alive as possible. So um, he was very well respected by his, his, his company. They, they allowed him to get away with this incredibly uh, eccentric behaviour for, for a soldier. Um, in, in 1917 to 1919, of course, he then get the, um, uh, the revolution in Germany breaking out. Uh, he was elected by his, his company to the, the Soviet of Soldiers. Um, and um, once, once the, his company was eventually demobilized in 1919, sort of threw himself into uh, the radical politics of Germany at the time. Uh, he joined the USPD in 1917, the KPD in 1920, uh, was briefly Minister for Justice in the Thuringian government, uh, wrote Marxism and Philosophy between 1921 and 1923. It, it, it was published at almost exactly the same time as... Um, History and Class Consciousness, Lukács' uh, major work, and the two were bracketed together and, and denounced together, um, which I'll come on to in a bit. As the, um, the 20s progressed, he became more and more critical of what was happening in Russia, uh, and was eventually expelled from the KPT in 1926, and kind of throws his lot in with various kind of libertarian, ultra-left kind of communist currents, uh, flees Germany in 1933 after the Reichstag burns down, uh, and he spends the rest of his life uh, in the US as an academic, uh, eventually ending up in the Institute for Social Research uh, in, in New York uh, and, and dying in 1961. So, okay, that's a very, very potted kind of biography, of course. Um, why is Marxism and Philosophy an interesting book? What, what are the key arguments in it, and why, why did it end up? Uh, uh, riling the kind of uh, 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 Russian Marxist establishment that was, by the time this came out, kind of on its way towards Stalinism. Um, the basic argument in, in Marxism and philosophy, uh, and it's a very similar argument to, to what you get in history and class consciousness, uh, is that the reformist practice of the Second International uh, was allied to its theoretical adoption of a vulgar materialist stance in philosophy. So uh, he argued that the, the Second International 
uh, in terms of its philosophical stance, uh, play down the importance of ideological struggle in philosophy, and at the same time ends up kind of reflecting uh, a bourgeois common sense. Um, now, of course, this, this diagnosis was not was not really very welcomed by by the, the, the Russian communist movement at the time, and, and Korsh soon found himself attracting very sharp criticism. Uh, he was denounced by Kautsky, but he was also denounced by Zinoviev and Deborin and the various other kind of strain of the sort of Bolshevizing strain in, in, in the Comintern, who insisted that the, the communist break with the Second International's political practice should not be extended to a break with, with uh, the, the philosophy associated with the Second International, uh, so-called dialectical materialism. Um, there was actually an article in, um, in Historical Materialism last year, I think it's volume 20, issue 2, by Alex Levant, who actually goes into the history of, uh, uh, the history of Soviet philosophy and shows there's a kind of continuity between <coughs> the Mensheviks, Plekhanov, Second International stuff, through to Borin, and straight into the Stalinist period. It's not, you know, that that, that, that continuity there is really uh, what Korsh is kind of kind of gunning at. So again, uh, Lukash is making similar arguments about the same time. And, and when when uh, history uh, when Marxism and philosophy appears, uh, Korsh initially says that well, basically I agree with Lukash. So later on, as the two their paths kind of diverge, it's a weird sort of symmetry because. Lukash kind of starts on the ultra left and then moves into a sort of popular frontist Stalinism, whereas Korsh kind of goes the other way around. He starts from the Fabians and ends up in the ultra left. But they kind of cross over in the twenties, and, and, and they're, 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 they're good friends, but they they move apart a bit. Um, and they're, they're both they're both kind of lumped together uh, and denounced as theoretical revisionism. Um, and and the argument that you get is. This somehow parallels uh, the, the ultra-left political practice of communist parties in Western Europe. Um, as Zinoviev says, if we get a few more of these professors spinning their Marxist theories, we shall be lost. That's Zinoviev, <laughs> the fifth, com, com, uh, com, fifth congress of the Comintern in 1924. Okay, so um, what are the, uh, the main arguments in Marxism and philosophy? The first one, and I'm just going to kind of summarise them very briefly, um, the first one is that there is an antagonistic relationship between Marxism and philosophy. Um, Marxist theory, Marxist philosophy, uh, is something that actually seeks to supersede um, philosophy in general. Uh, Korsh talks about uh, uh, Marxism uh, realising philosophy by abolishing it. I mean, and he draws this, what he calls a parallelism between Marxism's attitude to the state and Marxism's attitude to philosophy. So you see here again this idea that in the same way as the Second International kind of drops its revolutionary practice in, in favour of a, a reformism in practice, the, there's a similar, it kind of drops its critique of philosophy. And that, that, that's part of, uh, part of um, uh, Korsh's uh, key, key, key kind of criticism of it. Now, Given this antagonism, it means that there are two things that Marxism shouldn't do, that, that Korsh argues it, it has effectively done. Um, one is that it can't simply ignore philosoph philosophical questions. When, when Marx says, you know, philosophers have interpreted the world, the point is to change it, he doesn't mean that, well, we just leave philosophy behind and go off and do something totally different instead. Um, in fact, he argues quite strongly that, that, that when you get that kind of approach, what you effectively get is um, Marxism says nothing about philosophical questions, so it may as well say anything. You can be a, a Marxist revolutionary and privately, in your private life, a devotee of Schopenhauer's philosophy. You know, that, that, that will be fine. So, so, so um, he rejects this notion you can simply kind of uh, ignore philosophical questions. Um, but he also says, you know, neither can... Marxism simply kind of adopt a philosophical position and say, well, well you know, that, that one's ours. Instead, you've got this, um, this permanent kind of antagonism. There, 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 there's, in, in a sense, there's no such thing for Korsh as Marxist philosophy, but that makes the relationship between Marxism and philosophy more important, not less. Now, the second point, uh, key argument that he, that he makes, and this is one that he hammers on, on over and over again, it runs all the way through, 
is about a very, very tight dialectical connection between theory and practice. Um, in fact, Kors pretty much defines dialectics as a tight connection between theory and practice. He says that dialectics is the coincidence of consciousness and reality. There's a, an echo there of uh, Parmenides, the same is there for thinking and being. If thinking and being are together, you've got a dialectical way of looking at things. When they drift apart, it's undialectical. And, and moreover, that the consciousness of that connection goes up and down with with the class struggle. So in periods, revolutionary periods, where, where class struggle is high and class consciousness is high, you get the adoption of theories that are dialectical in cautious sense, that they understand that there's this link between theory and practice. When those, those movements ebb um, and, and weaken, uh, uh, you, get, you, get, uh, you get them splitting apart. And in particular, the, he argues that the theories of of second international Marxism end up doing essentially doing two things. On the one hand, they kind of fall back into a vulgar <coughs> materialism, a kind of common sense that the key things he, he rails against are reflection theories of, of knowledge and correspondence theories of the truth and so on. Of course, she thinks all of this is, is <coughs> not materialism. Um, the other thing that the second international Marxism did, of course, is it kind of makes its peace with neo-Kantian uh, academic humanities and academic sciences, which is also something Korsh says it, it shouldn't really be doing. It should, it should have a, a, kind of, a kind of tension uh, with that, because those theories are ultimately linked to, uh, they are ultimately bourgeois ideologies and are linked to bourgeois rule. So, um, if, and, and the, third, the third point, and the, I, I think perhaps the kind of the most curious one in the book, which pops up and it, it pops in and out, uh, he mentions it a few times, uh, is that, that if, if theory and practice do have this, this tight link, that means that the history of ideas has to be seen in terms of the history of political movements and the history of practice, and that has to apply to Marxism itself. So there's this very, very interesting reflexive gesture. Uh, in, in 1930, he, he uses the phrase... Um, the, he said the essence of this book is that, that I applied the materialist concept of history to the materialist concept of history itself. Um, now, what happens if you do this? And I, th I think you get a kind of a slightly, slightly peculiar, um, sort of slightly peculiar situation because if, if you start to um, apply uh, historical materialist analysis, of Mar a Marxist analysis, to its own history. A certain sort of uh, uh, suspicion of your own history emerges. You kind of step away from it slightly. And I think that kind of creates uh, a break, which I find very interesting, of course. He's, he's got this, he's, he's very, very um, down on the notion that the history of ideas is one of development and things rolling out. This is something he absolutely associates with bourgeois thought. He dismisses this. Instead, the emphasis is always on those points where struggle breaks out and there's a break in, the, in, in, in thought. And he, he, in fact, he schematizes the history of Marxism into three phases. One goes up to 1848, then there's a break, and a certain kind of Hegelian Marx uh, and Engels gets replaced with a more scientific one, uh, a capital and so on. That period goes through the Second International, then there's a, a break at 1914, and then the communist movement is founded, and of course, Korsh is basically arguing that we now need to extend that uh, that political break into, into, into a theoretical one. Uh, I've got about five minutes left. Um, three. Three. Okay. I shall very rapidly ru uh, run through why why I think Korsh is a kind of a precursor of Alan Badia. Uh, I, I say precursor. What, what, what do I mean by that? Um, I'm not trying to suggest that 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 Korsh was some kind of direct influence on Badia. I, I know of no such influence. I'd be surprised to find one. Uh, and I'm not really suggesting that Badia's rather peculiar post-Maoist politics that he espouses are in some way comparable to Korsh's position. Uh, they're both idiosyncratic ultra-left academics, but I think the similarity kind of ends there, really. Uh, my, my point really is that, that, that they both concede, and coming perhaps from different directions, but they both concede that the, the relationship between philosophy and revolutionary political thinking in, in, in quite similar ways. And that, that's what I just want to 
of explore. And for my money, I, I think they both get this very delicate question right, which is why I, why I kind of um, interested in the first place. Um, the first the first point is um, I'm going to kind of summarise back to you very quickly here. So if, if, apologies if, if this is um, uh, terribly crude, but. Um, Badia has this notion of anti-philosophy, that, that, uh, that philosophy for, for Badia is not something that produces truths of its own accord. Rather, that there are these militant practices in the world, uh, artistic, scientific, political, or amorous, and these are these conditions, these practices, are what produce truths. Philosophy kind of comes along afterwards and tries to bring them together, pinch them together in some way. But it, 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 there's this kind of... Uh, Acknowledgement, in particular, that political thinking is something done by political militants, revolutionary political militants. It's like the opposite point of view from the idea that, well, you know, you get these political movements out there, but they're the, they're the kind of the mob running wild, and they've got their passions, and they don't really understand what they're doing, and the professor of political science has to come along and explain it to them. The idea very much has the opposite point of view. It is... Politics is a ponce, it's a, it's a thinking activity. So you've got that, that notion of um, a unity of theory and practice there uh, that comes up with its own truths. And, and philosophy has a kind of... A, a, and and that, that, in, in, in doing that, it is in a rivalry with philosophy. And th this is why Badia picks up on this term anti-philosophy, which is actually from Lacan. Lacan describes what he does as an anti-philosophy, something that's challenges and criticizes philosophy and is on a fundamental level um, uh, constitutively antagonistic towards philosophy. And interestingly, in 1930, um, uh, in one of his essays, Karl Korsch uses exactly the same phrase. He describes Marxist theory as an anti-philosophy which yet in itself remains philosophical, which I think captures that notion of antagonism plus engagement. Um, the, other, the other couple of points I thought that of, of relation between the two is that... Uh, there's a very strong current inside that idea of, of criticising what he calls doxa, the circulation of opinion. He sees you know, academia, philosophy, thinking as really kind of this big machine for producing opinions and setting them into circulation in the same way as capitalism produces goods and sets them into circulation. And he, he sees truth as something that stands in opposition to this. Truth punches a hole in knowledge, again, is uh, the, the, the Lacan phrase that, that Badia picks up on. Um, and similarly, uh, we see in Korsh this notion that the political truth that uh, Marxist political practice generates has to stand in, in opposition to attempts to absorb it or dissolve it into academic knowledge. So you've got in Korsh this, this very suspicious attitude towards the humanities, towards, uh, towards sociology, towards all this kind of uh, neo-Kantian uh, 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 humanities stuff that was, uh, was around in, in the late 1800s. Um, and he uh, course insists that Marxism has to be opposed to both this kind of bourgeois science and to common sense and metaphysics to uh, the materialism. Um, the third thing, and I, I'll end on this, is uh, the conception of, of time and history. Um, there is a I mentioned earlier that there is this kind of curious way that, that Korsh periodizes things. That it, the emphasis is on the breaks uh, rather than the flows. And there's this kind of anti-Heraclitus move that I think is quite unusual because you know, most of Marxist and Marxist-inspired philosophy puts a great deal of emphasis on continuities. You know, behind every break, there's meant to be a continuous process underneath. In both Badia, well, Badia for mathematical reasons more than Else, but, but also in Korsh, there's an emphasis not so much on those flows, but on, on the breaks that constitute them. He talks about uh, how the curious way that Lenin's break with the Second International it, uh, is, is, is presented by Lenin, or and at least understood by Lenin, as a return to origins, a return to the source, a return to a pure, pure Marxism. But Korsh says that that's an ideological guise. What you've actually got there is a dialectical development, a proper dialectical development, which involves a break and refoundation rather than merely uh, a flowing, flowing outwards. Um, I was going to say a little bit about what this all, all, all means for today, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll stop, stop at this point. I'll just, just end with the point that uh, 
I think that uh, this is still relevant because Marxist tradition today uh, rubs up against contemporary thinking, contemporary philosophy, contemporary theory in, in contradictory and difficult ways. Um, I, I do think that Marxist uh, political practice and theory is still unrivaled in its scope and potential to integrate insights and, 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 and uh, if you like, fuel a revolution movement, but it has to be able to cope with all, the, all these new ideas. And what, um, what Korsh, I think, tells us is that, that we can do this, we can reinvent these traditions without either liquidating or shattering or, or on that encounter. But in order to do that, uh, that involves scrutinising theory, our theory as well as our practice, uh, and it involves understanding that before tradition, political traditions are sustained by continuities, uh, they have to be inaugurated by breaks. Okay, uh, we've got 20 minutes for questions.